So welcome, everybody. Um, uh, I'm Kevin Watkins. I'm director here at ODI. Uh, we have a wonderful lineup today. I'd like to welcome all of you. Um, we the um, the order of proceeding is that uh, Neven Mimitsa, the the commissioner, is going to deliver a keynote speech from the lectern. Uh, we'll then have three sets of comments from our speakers who I'll, I'll introduce uh, uh, after, the, after the speech. J just by way of introduction, I, I, the, the issue that the Commissioner will be addressing today is clearly one that goes right to the heart of the aspirations of the international community reflected in the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, for those of you who haven't memorized all of the Sustainable Development Goals and associated targets, uh, Goal 16 re refers to the ambition of creating a peaceful and secure world by 2030 and of building the accountable and responsive institutions needed to underpin that world. And uh, like, like um, motherhood and apple pie, that's clearly something that we, we all want to see getting from where we are to that destination is clearly not a straightforward journey, but that, that is the challenge uh, uh, which will be at the heart of the presentation that we're going to hear today. I think it's self-evident that the European Union has a critical role to play in advancing the international security uh, and development agenda, both by virtue of its diplomatic weight in foreign policy initiatives in the peaceful resolution of conflict, uh, in, in reconstruction, rebuilding societies affected by conflict, as a development actor that is, uh, has the potential and the financial resources to make a difference with respect to the sustainable development goals, uh, and of course in the arena of foreign policy and diplomacy more broadly. The, the challenges, however, are immense. They're immense on Europe's own doorstep, if you look at the Ukraine crisis, which is a, re really has become one of these frozen conflicts where there's been very little movement and the European Union hasn't necessarily distinguished itself as a major actor in, uh, in, in brokering and advancing peace in the Ukraine. If you look at the Middle East region and the Syria crisis, the crisis in Yemen, the, these are ongoing in part because we haven't had the diplomatic impetus, the political leadership to broker the, the, the type of settlement that, that needs to happen. If you look beyond these immediate conflicts, and I, I, I should add, of course, that the Syria conflict has thrown up a refugee crisis which now threatens to unravel the European project, in a sense. So Europe's failure to ad adopt a a clearer and stronger position in, in relation to that crisis has wider ramifications. If you look at the Sustainable Development Goal agenda, whether we talk about the ambition of eliminating $1.90 poverty by 2030, ending avoidable child deaths, getting every child into secondary school, the countries that are furthest off track on each of those goals are uh, fragile and conflict-affected countries. So the challenges are absolutely immense. It, it does strike me that the responses to these challenges have to involve collective action. I think it, it's clear that countries acting alone are not going to be able to bring SDG 16 within reach in any particular part of the world or in relation to the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, it, it often strikes me that one of the invidious aspects of being a commissioner is it's a little bit like the UN, that it's very easy to clock to you know, to look around the world at every crisis and every failure and to point the finger at the United Nations. You know, the United Nations could have brokered a settlement. The United Nations could have done better in framing the SDGs. The UN could have done better in rebuilding societies affected by conflict. But, but actually, with multilateral institutions, you get what the member states want and what they allow to happen. Uh, and, and I think one of the challenges for commissioners is to work in an environment where you don't necessarily have uh, 
a unified voice behind you in the form of uh, you know, a clear commitment to collective action on the part of, um, of political leaders in the member states. So uh, against that backdrop, Commissioner, we very much look forward to hearing your, your comments. The, the floor is yours for 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished participants, dear development community friends, uh, I would like to thank the Overseas uh, Development Institute for inviting me today here. Our topic is of immense and immediate uh, relevance for politicians, for officials, and for ordinary citizens equally. Promoting peace and security is an area where the European Union, with uh, its all member states, should be a global leader, where the added value of collective action seems obvious and much needed in today's world. However, too often the European Union has difficulty to arrive at a strong collective effort and impact. Why is that? And how can the European Union become more effective in this area? Let me share some of my thoughts from the EU development cooperation perspective. For development actors, security and peace building is not a new arena. But it has definitely acquired new relevance and urgency. It is no accident that this is strongly highlighted in the new 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Without any doubt, addressing fragility and conflict is and has been central to development effectiveness. Today, traditional concepts of development policy and assistance are being challenged, hugely under pressure from unprecedented crises and the burst of violence and different forms of threats, both inside and outside the European Union. We face complex security challenges that undermine development and weaken states, including terrorism, trafficking in drugs, arms and human beings, money laundering, cybercrime and threats to critical uh, infrastructures. We face increasing demands uh, to address the root causes of irregular migration and instability, and to step up our efforts on security-related issues. Where are we at? Significant parts of the EU's external assistance are already targeted towards security and development challenges. Around 30% of our overall development assistance is spent on governance, peace and security. EU engagement in fragile states has increased over the years, both in scale and scope. Today, it presents more than 50% of EU development funding. Peace and security related initiatives have regularly been taken within various regional strategies. <clears throat> the future framing of relations with our partner countries under the Cotonou Agreement will inevitably include a discussion on how to strengthen the EU's response to the security challenges, particularly in Africa. But engaging in the complex linkages between peace, security and development is a challenging terrain and there is no golden bullet. To become more effective, we need to be both more comprehensive and holistic pulling together all our resources, but also more targeted, using better our instruments and tools. Firstly, we need to work better together and in a more strategic way. In 2013, we defined an EU approach to external conflicts and crises to guide collective actions across European Union institutions and member states. We will report on the results in the coming months, analyze the gaps and define further targets in this area. We are also currently engaged in broader consultations on the new EU global strategy, 
which will update and replace the current EU security strategy. This is an immense opportunity to rethink and reshape how the European Union works together with its member states and other partners at the global level and to give development cooperation a proper place in the overall multilateral setup. Secondly, we need to refine our tools and make them fit for purpose. <coughs> we do have good examples, like the instrument contributing to stability and peace. It enables the European Union to address some of the most pressing security concerns, such as terrorism, piracy, and biological and nu uh, nuclear threats. We have uh, many success stories of uh, how our instrument for democracy and human rights helped strengthening the human rights, peace, justice, and the rule of law frameworks, and in supporting human rights defenders all over the world. We have also established trust funds for Syria, for the Central African Republic, and most recently, the EU Emergency Trust Fund for Africa, to be able to act more effectively in specific crisis situations. At the same time, we are fully aware that further efforts are needed at EU level to ensure more coherent and effective instruments and action. A good case in point is our current work on the capacity building tools for security and development to enable our partners to prevent and manage crises by themselves. This includes improving cooperation between civilian and military actors within the European Union, but also engaging more with the security sectors of our partners. As you can imagine, this is quite a challenge and demands carefully, uh, careful reflection uh, as, uh, so as to find legally and politically sound solutions. From a development perspective, we need to keep our eyes on the key prize, the long-term development of partner countries and the expansion of opportunities for people, especially girls and women, to live a decent life and have their basic needs met. And linked to this, to build upon strong, viable democratic institutions that serve their citizens. Where do we go from here? The recently adopted Agenda 2030 has recognized well that there can be no sustainable development without peace, and no peace and security without sustainable development. Global Goal 16, building just, peaceful, and inclusive societies, is now fully embedded in the Sustainable Development Agenda, and rightly so. This is an important step forward, and our new chance, an invitation to strongly focus on conflict and violence prevention, peace and resilience building, an impetus to win and better manage peace, rather than crisis, and to build a new narrative around the development cooperation and its role in the security agenda. To be able to do that, we will also need to understand and address the root causes better by improving our evidence base and analysis. But also, we will need to use untapped potentials better L like by including more women in uh, negotiations and peace-building efforts and in decision-making processes, better defined and measure outcomes, and most importantly, create more synergies in the patchwork of EU structures, instruments, pillars, and internal and external actions. Peace and security agenda will be increasingly at the heart of the European Union's external relations, and the role that the European Union wants and needs to play on the, uh, on the global stage. Today's world requires leaders and allies not only to fight against violent conflicts and insecurity, but to wage peace and the rule of law. For the European Union and its member states, 
including the U UK. One known remark from Sir Winston Churchill can still sound so pertinent. There is at least one thing worse than fighting with allies, and that is to fight without them. So we all better get to it in unity of efforts at the European Union level and in a collective action with partner countries, with, uh, with the United Nations and other international partners, and of course, civil society organizations, which must continue to play a major role. Thank you very much. Commissioner, thank you for providing us with such a comprehensive overview in such a short uh, uh, but, but uh, well-directed uh, keynote address. Uh, I'd like to pass over now to, uh, to introduce Beverly, and who is the Director of Conflict and Human Security in, in DFID and has uh, 16 years' experience working in, in DFID in different parts of the world. And uh, so Beverly, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kevin. <clears throat> Um, you'll be disappointed to hear that I very much agree with most of what the Commissioner has said. It doesn't make for that healthy debate, but I'm sure Anthony will come in as the disagreement. I'm very pleased to be here to be able to respond to the Commissioner's points. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and I very much agree with him that insecurity and inst inst instability are two of the main barriers to reducing poverty. This has long been the case, but never more so than mm. in the recent past. We have made progress on economic growth and poverty reduction in developing countries in the last 15 years. But this has been during a time of relative peace and security. The last five years have seen an increase in global conflict and violence, including violent extremism. And this is clearly set to continue in the next 15 years. So we expect to continue making development progress, but the very poorest people will be the hardest to reach. By 2030, we estimate that 62% of the world's poor, that's a billion people, it's really hard to imagine a billion people, isn't it, will live in fragile states compared to 43% today. There are over 51 million people living as refugees from violent conflict, which is the highest figure since World War II. So the challenge of helping those in the greatest need is growing. This is a global problem which requires a collective response. Within the UK government, DFID's made a strong case that building stability overseas is in the UK's national interest. That's a clear theme in the UK's Strategic Defence and Security Review. We call it the SDSR, which the Prime Minister recently launched in November. As the Prime Minister said then, our aid budget is the act not only of a moral nation, but of one that cares about its own security. Broken or conflict states tend to produce huge problems for issues for us at home as well. Ebola is one such example where the UK took a leading role, tackling a difficult issue head-on and helping to prevent a regional problem from turning into a global crisis. That's true of DFID's work on peace and security. In the SDSR, DFID pledged to spend at least 50% of its budget on fragile states and regions in every year of this parliament. This reflects a shift we've been making since 2010. We are focusing on the toughest areas to stop problems developing and to ensure that no one is left behind. Our national interests are served by a joined up approach focused on supporting peace and security in fragile states. The same is certainly true in an EU context. Over 50% of development in fragile states is delivered through multilateral institutions like the EU. And it's not just in the EU's interests for this to translate into a strong collected effort. So in the interests of all aid donors and recipients. <coughs> we believe the EU has an important role to play in promoting peace and addressing the drivers of instability in the world. We agree with the Commissioner that an effective response requires close coordination with member states' bilateral work and complementary with other international and regional bodies like the UN and the AU. The EU's wish for a strong collective effort could be aided by a more compelling narrative of where the EU adds value in conflict prevention, crisis management and post-conflict reconstruction. We believe this could be informed by a strategic assessment of recent EU initiatives as well as a structured approach of documenting the results and impact. We would encourage the EU to expand its evidence base. It was great to hear the Commissioner talk about this approach to development interventions. Related to that, we welcome 
the EU's setting up of a research and evidence facility to support its trust fund on tackling migration in Africa. By building the evidence base for its programming and sharing this knowledge with others, the EU will take greater steps to better collective action. Separately, we would hope to see better coordination between the Council's activities. In the UK, we've improved our joint efforts through a cross-departmental conflict, stability and security fund, which has enabled government departments, including DFID, to better link strategic decision-making action on the ground and provide a framework for cross-departmental action in fragile states. A whole of EU effort could be achieved along similar lines, making the best of its developmental diplomatic defence and law enforcement capabilities that we've done here. The upcoming EU global strategy could provide a useful way of shaping and guiding this work. The Commissioner also rightly mentioned the global goals, especially Global Goal 16, <clears throat> which highlights the interdependence between peace and development. The Commissioner's right, it's time to win the peace. A peace-building approach should be central to the EU strategy to achieve this goal in fragile and conflict-affected states. I also agree with the Commissioner that just as peace-building should be central to the EU, so women should be central to peace-building. Again, we have a vested interest in this being the case. Evidence shows that women's participation in peace processes and decision-making results in agreements that are reached more quickly and are more lasting. Our Secretary of State at DFID has put support for girls and women at the heart of the UK's international development work. Our new aid strategy states that throughout all its development spending, the government will continue to prioritise the needs of girls and women. There may be various practical examples of this in 2016. As you know, the UK is uh, hosting the Supporting Syria Conference next month. Women and girls need to play an important part in this conference, both in discussing humanitarian assistance and the future stabilisation and reconstruction of Syria. We also intend to take a strong position on promoting gender equality and tackling sexual violence at the first World Humanitarian Summit coming in May. There are various opportunities in 2016 to support peace and security. We hope to maximise our contribution to these and we will work with the EU to help them do likewise. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Beverly. Beverly, I know you, you have to leave us um, shortly. So, uh, and you're, you can't stay for the question yes, and answer right. session. So what, what I would like to do is maybe just to ask you a couple of sure. questions okay. that I'm sure somebody in the audience would have asked if, <laughs> if, uh, if you were staying. I, uh, the, 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 the first one relates to the... So I, I think there's a broad agreement in relation to the SDGs that more needs to be done for fragile and conflict-affected mm. mm. states. And there's a very strong commitment that you mentioned from the UK mm. to, <coughs> to increase aid disbursements to these states. Mm. That, th that is often easier said than done because you know, these aren't states with budget systems that are designed mm. to you know, absorb rapidly uh, increased flows. Mm. So, I, so the, the, the first question is, what, what do you see as the different delivery modalities in order to achieve the commitment <coughs> that, that's been set? And the, the, the second question I wanted to ask you was really on the humanitarian system, which obviously has a key role to play in this area. And it, it seems to me that it suffers from a twin deficit, which is an overall financial resource mobilisation mm -hmm. problem, mm -hmm. you know, which we see every year in relation to the Syria crisis. And it, it's great that mm -hmm. the meeting next week will address that. Mm -hmm. But it's also what some people would see as, you know, as an insufficiently inclusive system that many of the actors who could make the greatest difference might be local actors, regional actors, who tend to get a small part of the pie mm -hmm. through the system. Mm -hmm. So those two questions, the, you know, the, the mechanisms for delivering more aid to fragile states and how do we build a more inclusive mm. humanitarian system? Thank you very much. Um, thanks. On the um, first question, how do, we, how do we spend our money in fragile states? It's something that we have been doing gradually, as you know. Our, our commitment in 2010 was around 30% and we've now committed to scaling up to 50%. Um, to be honest, it's, it, the, the language is also around um, regions as well, because it's pretty clear to us that some of the countries affected are the countries next door to those with fragile states, particularly with the, with the um, forced displacement of people. So um, we, we have got a, a number of modalities in DFID. As you know, we've moved away a lot from the direct money to governments, the direct support under this, under this uh, uh, government that we have at the moment in the UK. But there are a number of modalities that we have. Uh, in, in a number of these countries, we have a big DFID office. 
So we manage money ourselves. We manage our own projects and programmes. In some of these countries where we don't have an office, we're looking at the moment on what those options should be, on where we have a presence on the ground and where we spend through others. DFID spends a lot of its money through others. More than 50% of our budget is spent through multilateral organisations. So we'll look for the best mix we can on some of these. I think what's interesting to me, moving into this job and being quite new, um, is a lot around the evidence we've got and how sometimes that's quite patchy. So building in really strong monitoring and evaluation on these programmes is really important to us so that we can get evidence of what goes wrong. Um, and where we can and where we can best spend. So we've got uh, we've got a number of options. Um, we spend through NGOs, we spend through the multilaterals, or we do it ourselves. Um, and we run our own programs, and we run programs through others. We are doing less of that, giving money directly to governments. And obviously, in fragile states, that isn't possible anyway. What we are always keen to do, as ever, as uh, as we all are in development, is help governments strengthen their own institutions. Um, and that's something we're really keen to do. Um, but doing that in fragile states is obviously really tough, but something that you know, we're trying to do in places like Somalia, help, help the government strengthen itself and its systems. Great. And on the humanitarian system? Yes. Um, we have a World Summit in May. We are working really hard to achieve great things in that. We hope everyone who works in the system is helping us to do that. Uh, the more voices we can hear, the better. I am flying to Geneva this <coughs> evening because tomorrow all the donors um, and all the humanitarian agencies are meeting and it will be high on the agenda. Financing is a big part of that agenda and getting better financing and more predictable financing for crises is a really important part of uh, what we're lobbying for at the World Humanitarian Summit. We need more predictable financing. Going around with a begging bowl every time something bad happens in the world is not an acceptable way of financing in a modern world. So we are pushing hard uh, in the international system to make the financing better. And, and we hope to achieve great things in the summit in May. We need as many voices supporting that as we can. And, and just to push you slightly mm. on that, if, if you had to define two concrete, tangible, great things that you would want to see come out of the summit, what, what would they be? Particularly on financing, we want more predictable financing. Um, we're looking at what protracted crisis might be. There's a number of kind of issues we're looking at on that. Financing, one of them. We've got a paper on um, cash in... Uh, um, using more cash where possible. That's another one of our big papers we're putting into the summit. So there's a number of options we're looking at, yeah. Okay, Thank great. you very much, Beverly, Kevin. thank you. And uh, j just to let any journalist among you know that when Beverly walks out in a, whatever it is, 15 minutes, it's not walking out in protest of anything you've heard no, no, from the no. European Commission. No. So... Um, Can I speak? <laughs> ex exactly. Well, other people may walk out then, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, so let me uh, pass now to Anthony Smith, who is the CEO of the Westminster Foundation for Democracy. <coughs> Anthony, over to you. Thank you very much, Kevin, um, and thanks for the invitation uh, to join you. Um, and thank you, Commissioner, for... Um, I thought you were not going to use the word, but did you, you did use the word democracy once, I think, in your, in your remarks, or at least democratic. So I have some peg uh, on which to in my, my comments. Um, and it won't be surprising, given the organization that I uh, work for, that I want to focus on democracy, both in terms of values, but also in terms of uh, the way in which um, we as development actors work in, in practice. Um, I, I want to um, agree with you, I think, Commissioner, that um, it's important to address democracy as part of addressing the root causes of conflict and instability and insecurity. I'm not sure you said exactly that, but I think that's what I took from uh, your remarks and from papers from the Commission, um, and agree that the, the global strategy is a good place to uh, think about how to do this. Um, there are lots of instruments that the EU has to work in this field, but um, a clear and coherent analysis of how effective those are would be helpful. Um, and I also would agree with you and with Kevin what you said at the beginning that Goal 16 is important. I would say that Goal 16 doesn't solve everything. Um, I think uh, it's interesting that um, in the same way, Commissioner, you used the word democracy once, it was, um, I thought, revealing that the resolution in the General Assembly that adopted the SDGs only used the word democracy once. Um, and that's a contrast to the Millennium Declaration. The Millennium Declaration, 15, 16 years ago now, 
um, said a fair bit about democracy. It called for democratic and participatory governance based on the will of the people. That's language that's more or less from the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. It made a commitment, all of the countries in 2000 committed to implement the principles and practices of democracy and respect for human rights. So that was quite a strong commitment. Whereas in the resolution on the uh, sustainable development goals, there was a bit of language about a vision which countries had that at some point there would be democratic governance. So um, for me, I think the first thing um, to say is that it remains important for us in Europe to uh, focus on and not, not forget the importance of democracy and democratic governance and democratic values. We are, our organization is a values-driven organization. We believe in democratic values. Um, I think the second point uh, I would make is that there is a contribution, a distinctive contribution that, that Europe can make in these areas. Um, we have, to be frank, had a lot of practice at managing the challenges of internal conflict within our own countries, within our continent. Um, we've had practice um, at uh, addressing authoritarianism, uh, the abuse of power by the executive, um, and that, that experience um, has led to a position now which while a long way from perfect, um, is uh, pretty much as good as it gets in terms of uh, forms of governance which are um, reflecting the will of the people and preventing the abuse of power. Um, so I think that we, we have a variety of experiences which are, which are useful and which we can, can share with others. Um, and I think that the the uh, issue for us is how best to go about, about doing that. And again, I think Europe can, can make a distinctive contribution. I think that um, we have uh, a, uh, a tendency, an approach, a culture, which is not to shout about those issues as loudly as some shout about them, to recognize that there are many ways of addressing uh, the problems of um, effective governance, um, and to be willing to share those experiences and to allow others to reach their own conclusions about the right models for them. I liked the text which I was reading just before the meeting started from the Think, think Tanks document um, about the uh, global strategy, which um, recognize that po political change is essentially domestically driven. So the way in which external actors can try and address governance issues has to understand and recognize that. Um, and I think Europe can do a pretty good job in um, recognizing that uh, addressing governance challenge is a very long-term process which requires patience. Um, and we need to uh, reflect that, I think, in the global strategy and in the instruments that, that we use. Um, second area of specific uh, contribution that I think we can make is uh, that Europe can and should, I think more than it does at the moment, address politics directly. In general, I used to work with Beverly and DFID, and I think it's probably fair to say that um, you know, we, we dealt with the executive on the whole. Um, we didn't spend a lot of time dealing with parliaments and political parties. Um, and the, uh, the mantra that you hear in the democracy strengthening community is that um, development people aren't interested in uh, accountability through parliaments and parties. That's obviously an exaggeration, but there's a, an element of truth in it. And I think that um, while uh, some organizations like DFID, I think, are pretty far ahead in understanding the political context they work in, actually addressing the problems of the political system directly is something that we could do more of. And I think across Europe, we could, we could do, do more of that. Um, and then finally, I think that um, we need to get the balance right between the sort of political engagement that we have with countries whose systems are poor, that don't respect human rights as, as much as they, they could, that do not have strong democratic 
governance. So the balance right between the way in which we address those, uh, the leaders in those countries and the work that we do to build the capacity of the organizations that can change that. We have, as an, as an implementer of programs, a lot of work in many countries which are very poor um, uh, human rights records and democratic practices, but find partners who are willing to work with us on sometimes relatively small things which can be catalysts for bigger change in the future and at least lay the ground for change. So those are the comments I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let, 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 let me just um, maybe ask you a couple of areas for you to elaborate on the, one or two of the points you made. That You know, that the... I guess there's a, there's a broad view across government which is reflected in the golden thread narrative. So, you know, this is one of the, the areas that is a precursor to development, that if we get it wrong on democracy and institutions, other things will, will fail. I, I guess the question is, is aid an effective instrument? You know, what, what, re realistically, what difference does aid make to the promotion of democracy, human rights, or strong institutions? Are, are there concrete examples of practices that you would point to of where, where aid can make that difference? It depends, Kevin. I think if you're talking about um, does having a big aid program in a country in itself help deliver democracy? Not necessarily. And I've, I've been on a panel with somebody from ODI in the past who uh, was very challenging about the uh, evidence on a link between development and democracy. Um, <laughs> And I don't think anybody, I said we're a values-driven organization. We believe in uh, the ability of democratic systems to protect human rights and promote that, but don't uh, see delivery of uh, development in itself as addressing democracy. On the other hand, um, there is no doubt that there are parts of the political system we work with parliaments and parties, but of course, working on rule of law issues, on the media, supporting civil society are all part of the picture. There's no doubt that uh, resources can help, help those in those systems that are trying to reform the practices. <coughs> What's interesting for me in our organization is that the resources are not large. They're essentially about people, connecting with people. What, what uh, our partners like is to engage with peers so engaging with fellow parliamentarians or fellow party activists um, is crucial for them, either in um, countries with uh, European countries, for example, with more evolved democracies, or in their region. And I think regional working is very important. I think for, the, for, the, for Europe, it is notable, I think, that you need to have engagement of national systems as well as the EU, the national systems provide some of those peers. Thank you. Um, so I'd, I'd like now to pass over to Simon Maxwell. Simon is part of the ODI family, former director, is currently a um, research associate. He, he was also one of the lead authors, actually, of the report that you held up um, from the European think tanks group. So, Simon, over to you. Thanks, Kevin. <coughs> there are many advantages to not being director of ODI. <laughs> Some disadvantages, but <clears throat> I get more sleep. Um, one of the great advantages is of not being director is it gives me the opportunity to say in public how valuable ODI's research on these topics are. And there is a gold mine here, which, uh, Commissioner, you are able to mine, on the politics of fragile states, mm. on humanitarian relief, on issues like state building contracts in the aid world. And one of the things that work does is to explode some of the myths about oversimple definitions of democracy as an instrument for delivering change. It is an intrinsic good, Anthony, you're quite right. But we need to have a complex understanding of what drives change in fragile states. And ODI has made a big contribution to that, Kevin, so thank you. Um, and I also want to celebrate the work of the European Think Tanks Group, of which ODI is a key member, along with our colleagues in the Netherlands, in Germany, and in France. Um, and this report that Anthony mentioned has a really good chapter in it, which I had nothing to do with, but is worth reading on the business of working in fragile states. Uh, and we're just also working on the new global strategy, and we've just done a piece which says the SDGs must be central to the new global strategy. Um, 
I think the interesting question, though, is not so much to, today to talk about the theory, but to talk about what all this means for the UK and Europe as partners. We're about to face a referendum in the UK. So what I want to do in the next four minutes left is to talk about what all this means for the referendum. Um, does listening to this speech and to the responses make you more or less likely to vote to stay in Europe? And what action should we take in the UK <coughs> and what action should Brussels take to see whether there is more of a partnership? And I suppose my starting point is the same as yours, which is to say that collective action is the only possible solution to the problems we face. Does anybody think that we're going to solve the refugee crisis in Europe without really strong coordination between all the member states? Are we really going to abandon Schengen, have uh, barbed wire at every border across Europe and just multiply tenfold the crisis that we already have? Uh, so the collective answer action has to be the right answer to the problems. But if you read the papers in the UK, as I'm sure you do, Commissioner, EU in crisis is absolutely the dominant narrative. And we're not delivering the foundation we need for collective action. And sometimes it applies equally in the work we do in development on fragile states. Well, I'm slightly more optimistic about that. And there is definitely some evidence of successful EU collective action, not always in this field, but in Paris, the EU and the countries of the ACP, the Africa, Caribbean, Pacific Group, 79, is it? Um, uh, a high ambition coalition in Paris, which began to deliver change, a north-south alliance cutting across the G77 rich country boundary, a huge success for the ACP and for Europe. And I think we have similar examples that we can celebrate in this field. And they play very strongly to British interests. Um, we in the UK, Beverly, I guess, don't want to be mounting police missions in Mali, the Central African Republic, you know, the Sahel generally, Niger, because those are not areas where we have strong aid programs, but we have an interest. And it's actually good news for us that the UK um, is supporting those. We describe the EU in this piece we did as the best supporting actor. We don't do the frontline uh, in, um, military intervention, uh, perhaps thank goodness, but we do do really important work backing up peacemaking with police and civil militaries under the CFSP, the Common Foreign and Security Policy, um, and through the various instruments uh, that you talked about. Um, when we achieve state building contracts, we did an evaluation of those at ODI, highly positive actually, about putting donor money together into state building contracts. So we need collective action. It's not always as successful as we want it to be, but there are some really good building blocks there. What then does the UK do and what does the EU do to build the momentum around the collective action that we have on this issue of peace and security. Well, Beverly, I think you gave us some interesting pointers when you talked about the overarching narrative of the UK, but also of the EU. You talked about um, the importance of uh, the SDG framework and so on. Um, I think the EU is going to get there with the Mogherini-led uh, uh, security strategy. And why doesn't the UK come out very strongly and say, we really want an SDG-led security strategy and we'll put the resources um, into it. The EU has created instruments, including the trust funds that you talked about. Why doesn't the UK say, these trust funds are really a valuable way of bringing extra money into the system. Here's a couple of billion pounds over the next five years. Uh, let's actually break out of the straitjacket of the multi-annual financial framework that the EU uh, is landed with until 2020 and put additional money which will serve British interests but also serve um, EU interests. Let's acknowledge the reach and the size uh, of what the EU uh, can do and put some money into it and include better coordination. Now, that's not enough because we know that successful collective action needs the right incentives, it needs a high degree of trust, um, and it needs the right institutions. I think there are some things the EU could be doing as well. Um, asking for help in these places. Uh, working more intensively to put together the community of, of, of practice, um, which links, for example, the, the think tanks, the research institutes, and the policymakers around um, these issues. Finding out where collective action is opposed and looking at how the incentives can be changed uh, to make it more feasible. I think you need to demonstrate as an institution to the UK that you can be cost effective, efficient, effective, deliver value for money in those institutions. That means strong, independent um, 
uh, evaluation of the kind that we have in the UK with the Independent Commission on Aid Impact, and it means really strong parliamentary accountability as we have with our International Development Select Committee and as we are beginning to see in some areas uh, in the European Parliament. Trust doesn't just happen, it has to be built. Collective action doesn't just happen, the incentives have to be right. I think the building blocks are there, but I think both of you need to behave uh, slightly more assertively in building that across Europe. Uh, and if you can do that, uh, just to cite Benjamin Franklin, you cited uh, Winston Churchill. Benjamin Franklin said, you know, either we all hang together uh, or we hang separately. Uh, and we don't want to hang separately, we do want to hang together. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. I think when you said both of you, you pointed at me, but no, you meant no, Beverly. <laughs> Okay, so thank you. What I'd like to do now is to um, throw, it op throw the discussion open for questions. Commissioner, I will give you an opportunity at the end to come back on some of the points that have been raised. Uh, I would ask that people keep the questions brief so that we can get as many as possible in. I'm going to start uh, at the back uh, over here. 